Well, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for uh, being here. Thanks for tuning in online, if that's how you're watching this. Uh, my name is Matt Scogan, and I serve as the president of a place called Hope College. Hope College is a liberal arts institution in Holland, Michigan. We're more or less on the shore of Lake Michigan. We're a school of about 3,000 students. We were founded in 1866, and I've been the president of Hope for almost three years. But if you remember the Hair Club for Men commercials from the 1980s, I'm not just the president of Hope, I'm also a client. Or in my case, I'm a graduate, at least. Uh, this is me. Uh, I graduated in 2002 from Hope College, and this is my wife, Sarah. We met while we were students at Hope. Uh, we have three kids. Our kids are Sophie, Lucy, and Oliver. And I want to talk to you today about a vision that I and a growing number of people have, which is a vision for a future without college tuition. In other words, a vision for a different way of funding higher education. But before I get there, let me say a bit more about who I am and where I come from. As maybe you can tell, I'm, I'm a bit young to be a college president, so I'm 42 years old. The average age, it turns out, the average age of a college president in the United States today is 62. So that means I could do my job for another 20 years and still only be at the average age. Uh, most college presidents have a PhD, usually in education, and 85% of college presidents rose to their position through academia. None of, the, none of those things describe me. I'm a bit of an out-of-the-box college president. Uh, my story is a little bit different. I grew up in a small town in the south of Michigan called Portage. My mom was a middle school science teacher, and my dad was a chemist. He worked at a local pharmaceutical company. Both of my parents went not just to college, but also to graduate school. And so the importance of higher education was instilled in me from a very early age. I grew up, I think basically I, there was the expectation in my house that I was going to go to college. But for me, that was okay because I was excited to go to college. So that wasn't a problem. The problem was affording it. And my parents had not just me to worry about, but also my three younger siblings. I found out uh, later in my life that my dad had to take out a second mortgage on our house so that he could send me to Hope College. And even with that, I still had to take on a significant amount of student loan debt. And of course, my story is not uncommon. Many students today face debilitating financial barriers when it comes to attending college. Um, when I was, uh, the, the problem of course is, is, is way worse than it was when I was in college. When, when I went to Hope, the full price, sticker, the full sticker price, tuition, room, and board was around $20,000. Today, it's more than double that, $46,000. And I want to try to put that price increase in context for you because, of course, we all expect prices to increase over time. That's inflation. A lot of people are talking about that right now. Uh, consider just my lifetime. So I was born in 1979. From 1979 to today, the price of a gallon of milk, for example, has increased by 266%. Consider wages over the course of my lifetime. From 1979 to today, the average income of an American has grown by 223%. But look at what's happened to the price of a college education. Over the course of my lifetime, the price of a college education has gone up 907%. That is, even after you adjust for the increase in wages, the cost of college today is still four times greater than it was the year I was born. That is, it's four times more difficult for families to afford. Now, there, there's always naysayers, there's always critics when you bring up statistics like this. Um, here's one example. Uh, this is from the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to make you read that paper. I've already read it for you. And basically what this says is, yes, the sticker price of tuition has gone up, but so too have financial aid packages. And so students, in the end, aren't paying that much more, and we should all just calm down. But my response is, it's kind of hard for me to calm down when I look at what's happening to the student loan market in the United States today. Collectively, Americans owe more than $1.7 trillion in student loan debt. If that were the GDP of a country, that would be the ninth largest economy in the world. It seems a little excessive to me. The average amount of debt that a college graduate has today is, is nearly $40,000, and that amount grows every single year. It seems out of control, and the question is, how did we get here? Well, I want to talk mostly about a solution, but to set up that solution, let me talk for a couple minutes about how I think we got here. And here's the headline. My take is that we've seen this skyrocketing price of tuition and this skyrocketing amount of student loan debt, not because we needed to see it, but because we could see it. In other words, the price of college, in my view today, is expensive because there's no natural incentive to keep the cost down. Let me show you two things that help illustrate this. One is the student loan, uh, the structure of the student loan market itself. 
So student loans date back to 1944. Student loans were initiated in the name of making college more accessible and ultimately making the American dream more available to more people. It sounds great, like let's do that. But the problem is, as access to student loans increased, so too did the price of tuition by a lot. Let's call it the law of unintended consequences. And it makes sense because without a cap on the amount of money that students could borrow, colleges could just raise the price year after year and they could direct students to student loan programs to make up the difference, regardless of how much that difference became. Another thing that explains the rising cost of the sticker price of tuition has to do with how scholarships are funded at most colleges and universities in the United States. So let me try to show you this. Imagine that this graph is the demand curve for Hope College. So we're gonna have like economics 101 for a minute. This is the demand curve for Hope College. Uh, the, the market price, the break-even market price of tuition at, at Hope College is around $20,000. That's the average price that a student pays to go to Hope. But there's two problems with that price point. One is that there are some families who are willing to pay a whole lot more than that. The other problem is that there's a, a lot of students who we'd like to have come to Hope, but they can't afford the $20,000 price point. So what we do, and what nearly every other college and university does in the United States, is we set the price at the very top of our demand curve. And what it means then is that anyone who's paying more than $20,000 for tuition is paying for their own education and they're subsidizing scholarships for someone else. It's Robin Hood. We're running our own redistribution scheme. And you can have your own opinion on that. You can ask ethical questions about charging different people different prices for the same outcome. The point today is that this is just unsustainable. And it's unsustainable because it enables colleges to increase the sticker price year after year after year. In the end, for me, paying a lot of money for college was worth it because after I went to Hope College, all kinds of opportunities opened up for me. I went to Harvard for graduate school and then got jobs in Washington, D.C. at the highest levels of government, the White House and the Treasury Department. And then I pivoted to the private sector and worked in New York City for 11 years at the New York Stock Exchange in a global financial services firm. My story shows, I think, because I came from a family with very modest financial means and no family connections, I, I think my story shows that the American dream is still possible. Obviously, lots of people face even higher barriers than I did, but I think my story shows that you can still climb your way to the top. You don't need a back door or a side door. What you do need is a great education. And the research shows that this is true across the board. So there's an economist at Harvard named Raj Chetty, and Raj Chetty's work shows that students who come from different socioeconomic backgrounds but attend the same college have remarkably similar earnings opportunities after they graduate. It means that higher education is the great equalizer. It means that higher education is the solution to solving income inequality. But the problem is, with a high tuition, high debt funding model, that solution just isn't working. And the main reason it isn't working is because the price alone deters too many students from considering great colleges. So uh, surveys show that 73% of high school students say that they will eliminate a college from consideration just based on the sticker price alone. And these are students who probably would have been eligible for financial aid. Another 20% of students say they're not just eliminating colleges, they're thinking about eliminating the whole thing. They're thinking about skipping college altogether because of the sticker price. So that's the obvious negative effect that a high tuition price, high debt funding model has. But there's some other negative effect effects that I think are less obvious but are still worth pointing out. Um, consider, for example, grade inflation. This is less obvious, but I think it's interesting to talk about. As the price of tuition has gone up, students have become customers. What's a customer? A customer is someone with dollars in their hand looking to buy something. And you know the saying, the customer is always right. Well, the problem is when your student is a customer and you're supposed to be the teacher, that sentiment, the customer is always right, is kind of a problem. Enter grade inflation. So as this chart shows, the, uh, the, the trajectory of grade inflation over the last couple of decades has more or less tracked the trajectory of tuition increases. And I guess the question is, is that a coincidence? Maybe not. Maybe it's the fact today that students aren't just paying for their education, maybe they're paying for grades because the incentive structure is such that colleges and universities are kind of incentivized to give their customers the grades they want in order to protect the revenue, to protect the business model. Another negative effect that's somewhat less obvious of this high tuition price, high debt funding model has to do with impact. And what we see is that far too many students who graduate with a lot of student loan debt end up pursuing careers to chase income to pay off their debt 
rather than pursuing careers that have impact. So too many students are turning down potentially lower paid jobs but higher impact jobs in order to pay off their student loan bills. It, it means, in essence, that this tuition crisis in the United States is producing college graduates who are just working to make ends meet rather than working to make the world a better place. And the last thing I want to talk about here in terms of the negative effect of a high sticker price, high debt funding model is hard to talk about, but I think we need to talk about it, and it's mental health. So the, the CDC, which studies mental health, and by the way, these statistics are from prior to the pandemic, the CDC says that in an average year, 3.9% of Americans think about suicide. Now, th th thankfully, most of them don't make a plan or an attempt, but 3.9% of Americans think about it. It gets really troubling, however, when you start to break down some subcategories. So consider single women who make more than $100,000 a year. That's a, a substantial amount of money, but they have significant student loan debt. In that category, the number jumps from 3.9% to 5.9%, people who consider suicide every year. And if you look at single women who make less than $50,000 a year, but they have significant student loan debt, the number jumps all the way to 17%. This is literally a matter of life and death. Let me read you some quotes from a, a group, uh, a, a survey done last year by a group called Student Loan Planner. Uh, this first quote says, student loans make me feel like my life is not my own. Second quote says, I have constant anxiety about affording things and hesitation for major life experiences such as having a child, buying a house, buying a car, buying my, my own practice, or having a wedding. Half of my six-figure income goes to student loan debt, and it will for the next 23 years. It, solving challenges like that is what motivated me to apply for this position, president of Hope College. And ultimately, as I was thinking about all these things that we just talk, talked about, and stepping back even further and looking at the state of our country right now, the question I started to ask myself is, are we really gonna be a land of opportunity for all? Or are we gonna be a land of privilege for a few? And my take is that the answer to that question is gonna be decided in higher education. It's gonna be decided in academia. It's gonna be decided by the schools themselves. And so on July 1st, 2019, I became the 14th president of Hope College. And our ambition is to eliminate tuition as the way we fund higher education. And here's how, here's how we think it could work. So there are two prevailing funding models in higher education today. The first is a pay-as-you-go model, which means you pay your college or university every semester before the start of the semester. The second model is a pay-it-back model, where you, you pay a bank or a lender after you graduate. And of course, most people end up paying through some combination of those two. What we're imagining at Hope is not a pay-as-you-go model, and it's not a pay-it-back model. What we're imagining is a pay-it-forward model. And we call it Hope Forward. Here's how it would work. Students would come to Hope College, and their tuition would be fully funded, upfront, funded by the generosity of others. And they then make a commitment to give something to Hope every year after they graduate. We wouldn't specify an amount or suggest a percentage of income, nothing like that, because we want it to actually be a gift. We want it to be a gift that's given out of generosity. In essence, what we're trying to do is move away from bill paying to a business model that's based on gift giving, a gift economy. That's what we're trying to move to. And students, what they're doing when they're giving to Hope after they graduate, they're not paying for their own education because theirs was paid for. Rather, what they're doing is they're paying it forward. They're investing in the generations of students who come after them. We're excited about what it might mean, but it's gonna take some time and it's gonna take some money to switch our whole college from, of 3,000 people, 3,000 students, from the tuition-based model to this gift-based model. It's gonna take some time. So last summer, we embarked on a pretty daunting fundraising task, I have to say. We're trying to kickstart this gift-based model with uh, others giving to our endowment. So we're trying to get, grow our endowment by about a billion dollars so that we can fund tuition for our 3,000 students upfront and then move to this gift-based model. But because that's gonna take some time, and because that's gonna take um, a lot of people helping us, we're gonna go ahead and get started. And so here's what we're doing. Last year, we launched a, a small cohort, a cohort of 22 Hope Forward students. They're on our campus right now, they're freshmen. Next year, we'll have another cohort, roughly double that size. These students are not paying tuition. Rather, they've committed to a lifetime of giving. So we're pretty early into this experiment, but we've already learned a lot. And I wanna talk to you a little bit about what we've learned. The main thing we've learned is that this is gonna be way bigger than just solving the business model of higher education. It's gonna do that. It's gonna do that in a radical way. In a, in a dramatic way, it will solve the problem of access and affordability. But it's gonna do a number of other really interesting things. Let me walk you through a few of these. Uh, 
The first one is it, uh, is it aligns incentives in a really compelling way, I think. So, uh, for, for example, uh, under a hope forward model, we as an institution, we as the college are highly incentivized to help our students be successful after they graduate. Why? Because the more successful they are, the more opportunities they'll have to give. Today, it's students and parents who are continually asking questions about what's the ROI on my high tuition bill. Under a hope forward model, that burden shifts to us as an institution. We're the ones that have to make the education really good so that students are grateful for it after they graduate. Speaking of gratitude, we're excited about what it's gonna mean to have an alumni base, thousands of alumni who have committed to being givers. Of course, they've committed to giving to Hope, but we're gonna spend their time while they're at Hope, the four years they have at Hope, we're gonna spend time talking with them about what it means to be a generous citizen of the world in all the ways we would define that. So these 22 Hope Forward students, they've only completed one semester, but they're already starting to ask me questions like, how do I budget for a life of generosity? These are students who are gonna run out into the world asking questions like, how can I give to make this world a better place? And that's in pretty sharp contrast to the way most of the world thinks today. Most of the world looks around and says, what can this world do for me? What can I take from the world, not what can I give? So these students are gonna be givers and that's gonna make the world a better place, but interestingly, it's also gonna make them better. So there's a whole body of scientific research now that shows a strong correlation between giving and health and happiness. There's a professor at Yale named Lori Santos, and during the pandemic, she put, she's got this popular course called The Science of Wellbeing. During that pandemic, she put it online for free. You may have heard of it because three million people have taken the course. According to Santos, the three things that contribute to a life of happiness are number one, practiced generosity and gratitude. Number two, helping other people. The third one is getting sufficient sleep. So for college students, maybe that sleep thing is, is a lost cause, but the other two, with Hope Forward, we can build the other two into the structure, into the business model of Hope Forward. And we're excited about what that might mean. Let me keep going. Another thing Hope Forward does that we're excited about is it immediately, overnight, ends the relationship with students that just today feels too transactional. As a college president, I can't tell you how many times students or families will make an appeal to their tuition bill in order to try to, try to get what they want. So students might say something like, uh, I'm paying you X thousand dollars a year, so therefore the, whatever, the, the COVID mask policy ought to align to my preferences. Or parents might say something like, I'm paying you the full sticker price, and so therefore my student deserves the best living arrangement that you have. Here's what's happened. What's happened is that the tuition-based funding model has led to a sense of entitlement. And it's that sense of entitlement that is leading to this crazy arms race we're seeing in higher education right now, where way too many colleges and universities are trying to attract students to their campus based on amenities. Lazy rivers and pools and gourmet dining halls and luxury dorms. This stuff sounds like a great vacation, but it's not the point of college. The point of college is an education. And with Hope Forward, we're moving away from this consumer mindset, which I just think is toxic to a healthy learning environment. We're moving away from that and stepping into something so we intentionally begin our relationship with students, with Hope Forward. We intentionally begin it with an unbalanced relationship. It, it starts with imbalance. We just give them something up front. We give them something that's incredibly valuable. It's priceless, in fact. And by doing so, we're modeling for them in a radical way what it looks like to be a giving person, to have a giving mindset. Because a giving person is someone who's just constantly looking at what they have and saying, should I hold on to this or should I give it to make the world a better place? And there's no sense of entitlement in that kind of mindset. Another thing Hope Forward does is it creates all kinds of interesting opportunities around lifelong learning. So like everyone is talking about lifelong learning right now. With Hope Forward, one way you can think about Hope Forward is that it's moving from a, a pay for service model to a subscription based model. So by definition, students who come to Hope College are signing up to be subscribed to Hope for the rest of their lives. And we're excited about the opportunities that will give us around lifelong learning, having an alumni base that's engaged with us for their entire life. We're also excited about what it's gonna mean for the four years that they're at Hope. Because we actually think a Hope Forward model, and we're starting to see this with our 22 students, we think a Hope Forward model means that they might actually take their college years more seriously than when they're on a tuition-based model. Here's why. See, the number one critique I get for Hope Forward is people say, this won't work because students don't have skin in the game. People say, this won't work. Students won't take it seriously if they're not paying for it. But like, here's the thing. They have made a commitment. They've made a very real commitment, a very personal commitment, because they've committed to give their own money. This is not free tuition, what we're talking about. This is something entirely different. They've made a very personal commitment, their own money. It's not their parents' money, it's their own money. 
And we think in the end, that means students will feel more skin in the game than under the current model. We think it means that students will take their education more seriously than under the current model. The last thing I wanna say about Hope Forward relates back to impact. And we talked about this a little bit already. Uh, I mentioned that student debt skews the kind of things we see students doing after they graduate. It pushes students into careers just so they can pay off their bills. And if you talk to these 22 Hope Forward students and ask them what they wanna do after they graduate, these students, because they know they're not gonna be burdened by debt, these students are entirely motivated by impact. So they're talking about things like ending racial inequality in the healthcare system. They're talking about things like ending the school to prison pipeline in inner cities. They're talking about things like reducing homelessness through affordable housing. They're talking about things like suicide prevention in high schools. Like these students are ones who are gonna bring hope to hopelessness. And at the end of the day, that's why we're calling this hope forward. Because yes, this is gonna solve the business model of higher education. But this is gonna do something way more dramatic. If we can motivate a generation of students to run out into the world, looking at the problems of this world and say, I'm gonna bring hope to that problem, we've done something far more dramatic and far more impactful than just solving a higher ed problem. The last thing I wanna say as I close is that this is not a competitive thing for us at Hope College. Like this is not some secret strategy to try to increase our yield or attract more students. This is not branding. We're trying to start a movement we're trying to start a movement, and I would love it if other places would follow us, to use this as a model for other colleges and universities to pick up on. At Hope, we have a Christian mission. And so for us, having a business model that's inextricably linked to accessibility and communal generosity, that's tied to our Christian mission. But we actually think this could work at a lot of other places. And my hope is that Hope Forward could serve as a model for other colleges and universities. I just wanna end by going back to this question that ultimately brought me back to my alma mater, this question, are we really gonna be a land of opportunity for all? Or are we gonna be a land of privilege for a few? And what keeps me up at night when I think about that question is who we might be missing. Because the question is, are we missing the next great inventor? Maybe the kid who's gonna invent the cure to cancer, or the next great musician, the next great artist, the next great world leader. Are we missing somebody just because they happen to grow up in a different zip code? And here's the thing, the whole landscape of higher education knows this is a problem and very few institutions are doing anything creative about it. We come from a place called hope. We believe in hope. We believe that problems are solvable and therefore we wanna to run toward problems and try to go after them with hope. We're trying to bring hope back into higher education. Ultimately, we're trying to bring hope back to the American dream and we'd love to have others join us. We'd love to have others join us in this endeavor to try to move hope forward in the world. Thanks so much for listening. I'll stick around for conversations and questions. Thank you.